front room for the talks to start. Feel free to grab your pizzas and take it with you. We will start at 5.45, which is a few minutes now. When it's nice and cold, I can hold my baby closer to me and collect the kisses that undo me. I love the winter weather because I got my love to keep me warm. I love the winter weather So the two of us can get together There's nothing sweeter finer. When it's nice and cold I can hold my baby closer to me And collect the kisses that outdo me I love the winter Cause I got my love to keep me Winter's upon us, so won't you stay with me from Christmas to New Year's Day? Don't leave me alone. I won't let slide a fire and let it snow. I love the winter weather, so the two of us can get together. There's nothing sweeter. When it's nice and cold, I can hold my baby closer to me, to me. and collect the kisses that are to me. I love the winter, winter, because I got my love to keep me warm. Because I got my love to keep me warm. Because I got my love to keep me warm. Christmas time is here Happiness and cheer Fun for all the children call Their favorite time of year Snowflakes in the air, cabbles everywhere, olden times and ancient rhymes of love and dreams to share, sleigh bells in the air, beauty Tied by the fireside, joyful man is there. Christmas time is here. We'll be trying near all that we could always see. Such spirit through the year. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. How's everybody doing? Awesome. I'm loving this energy. Um, all right. So 2023, it's already end of the of this year. It's a little unbelievable for me. I don't know about you guys, 
But uh, here we are with a very good event planned out for all of you to learn from so many different speakers about different technologies. But before I start the talks, I'd like to tell you about who and what AI Camp is for those who are not aware. Um, and my name is Sonam. I am uh, the chapter lead for San Francisco Bay Area AI Camp Group. So first of all, this is the QR code, which if you scan, it will take you to the LinkedIn post. And if you could comment on it, share with the crew, uh, share with the people, after the end of all the talks, I'm going to run a raffle and I'm going to have two uh, winners draw out uh, from their name, uh, draw their name in the lucky draw, and they will get this really cool Bluetooth wireless headphone. And not just that, today we have Weaviate, which is a vector database company. I suggest definitely checking them out as well. Scan these code, and they will. They also have some gifts for you. Whoever scans, and yeah, I will run again the uh, lucky draw uh, thing, and then we will go from there. Keep scanning, keep scanning. Whoa, would you look at that? Can I get one? So since I'm hosting, could I get one? That would be great. If, if I could get one, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Ah, okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, who's AI Camp? What's AI Camp? We are AI community, which is uh, spread globally. You name the country and you'll probably find an AI Camp existence or some group there. And uh, the goal of this community is to connect all the AI developers or whoever is interested and curious about AI together through various different things, such as meetups like this one. We have online webinars, we have online hackathons, and so much more. And we have local community chapters in 50 plus cities and 15 plus countries, as you can see the name. And uh, we are very um, eager to get, you know, have people get involved with us in various different ways where, uh, you know, you can create a local AI developer community with AI Camp um, based on, you know, n number of topics in AI which are available now. You can submit the topics to give a talk for, for our next event, which happens every month. And you can, of course, sponsor the events. You have no idea how much it makes a difference because we get good pizzas. And today we have a GitHub who sponsored our happy hour, which is why there is like the end of year celebration with wines and beers. And um, yeah, contact us on this email um, and we can go from there. Next up is community shout out. I'm gonna give you maybe 10 to 20 seconds or 30 seconds, I'll be uh, gen uh, uh, generous there. If you are hiring for any role, if you're looking for a job, you're looking for co-founders or project collaborators, or you want to host events, now is the time. Raise your hand and I'll give you the mic for less than 30 seconds. Anyone? Oh. Okay, so um, I'm Sonia. I am creating a startup and this an artificial intelligence uh, to coaching and mentoring business roles and I am looking for collaboration co-founders of developers who wants to explore this area. I have uh, my background is computer science, and my last years I was working uh, with busy business roles, training them, coaching them. So I have this business um, information. Um, if you want to talk with me, so I will post in this group channel, and you can look. I'm looking for me. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go there first. Hello, uh, my name is Guru Yeleshwarapu. Uh, we have a EdTech platform. We, we hire interns on a regular basis. We are based out of San Ramon, but all our interns work virtually from anywhere. And we also launched a uh, EdTech platform, AI-based EdTech platform. We are actively looking for a co-founder who is strong on business development. So if you, any of you guys are interested, 
I am wearing this red jacket. It's easily you can uh, high wavelength jacket, so you can easily find me. I'll share my LinkedIn, but I don't have business card right now with me. Hey, um, hey everybody. Um, my name is Kaulani Mohamed, and uh, I'm trying to uh, uh, create basically um, a, um, a completely autonomous AI agent in a, um, as a combination of various AI agents put in a workflow that are completely um, like autonomous and not don't need any human supervision. This is what we call AGI, basically. If you can create a cash machine, first with human supervision, then without human supervision as the sentiment analysis and common sense of AI becomes more and more um, you know, developed and it's happening, we create AGI. So whoever is interested in autonomous AI agent, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. So my name is Valentine. I am building AI agents marketplace. It's agents.com. I have uh, more than 1 million paying users in my other business. So I want to make it easy for them to find any agent. I know there are almost a million agents in this place, but how do you know which of, of them can help you? So I want to solve this problem. I'm looking for founding engineers there. So welcome to connect and also to partner to put your agent on the marketplace or turn your app API into agent. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, I will have to continue, sorry. Awesome, so you see this another QR code that is to join our Slack channel, which you get where you'll get a lot of information. You can post whoever didn't get a chance to speak right now, they can post it on Slack and connect with folks from there. Three, two, one, go. Huge thanks to our wonderful sponsors, uh, GitHub to um, host us at this beautiful venue, as well as for the great drinks there, and Convex, Code Rabbit, Zillas, and Dagwars. Thank you so much for sponsoring this event. And that's it. Let's start with our um, fun event. Uh, Michael. We have our first speaker, Michael from Convex, and he will... Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Thanks. Good. Um, it's great to be here. My name is Michael Serb. I work at uh, Convex as a software engineer. And today I want to talk about building uh, context augmented. AI chat features into your products in practice. So I'll cover why I think it's worth building a custom AI powered chat in this day and age, what are the options for building one, uh, and which option should you choose. And first, let me introduce uh, a little bit about Convex for those who are not familiar. And maybe for this audience, the best way to introduce it is to look at our documentation site. And on the left side, you kind of see the feature set that Convex has. Uh, so it has functions for running arbitrary uh, computation on the server. It has a database for storing structured, unstructured, relational data, file storage for uploading and serving files, authentication for dealing with login, sign up, authorization, scheduling for both um, async scheduled jobs and cron jobs, full text search for searching the database using text, and finally vector search for searching our vector database uh, using vectors, and I'll talk about that more later. And uh, for those that, for, for whom that didn't mean anything, um, another way I describe Convex is uh, it's kind of like a higher level AWS in the same way that JavaScript is a higher level programming language over assembly, Convex is a higher level cloud over something like AWS. Uh, and two more analogies. Uh, Convex is a modern, truly scalable TypeScript and React-friendly Firebase. 
And, um, you know, I worked at Meta for seven years before joining Convex. And my vision for Convex is that we will make it as easy for folks to build full stack products as it is for um, folks working at Meta or at Google. So why build an AI chat in this day and age of uh, ChatGPT and Claude and Bart and Bing chat? Why build another AI chat? Uh, well, I think there are at least three good reasons. The first one uh, being proximity. People's behavior is driven by convenience. And talking to an AI right in your product, in a website and app, uh, will be more convenient than you know, going to chat GPT, typing something and coming back to your product. And second is control. Uh, big LMs have broad knowledge. And so to get a specific answer, you need to prompt them specifically. And your product can do that so that users don't have to repeat themselves. And third is context. Um, although, you know, chat GPT, GPTs are great, they have a lot of knowledge from training, uh, it's possible that they might lack specific knowledge relevant to your product, either because it didn't exist, or it wasn't public, or it wasn't important enough to show up in the training data. So, um, you know, providing the specific context as part of the prompt can lead to better accuracy and less hallucination. Um, and here I have like a hypothetical example of what a more sophisticated product integration of an AI chat could look like. So imagine you go to Amazon and you say, hey, uh, reorder the thing that I ordered two weeks ago, double it up. You know, it can show you the product in line in the chat. You can go back and forth and then you can confirm the purchase, right? So this is not really something that ChatGPT is going to do with all the products that are out there. Um, to figure out how we can build an AI-powered uh, chat, we uh, actually built one for ourselves. Um, yeah, good. Uh, so in our uh, doc site that I showed you before, there's this little uh, chat button um, that uh, you can talk to. So let me ask it. Uh, oh, yes, because I am not working. I have the docs open on my screen as well. There we go. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, in Convex, do, uh, rows and records in, in the database are called documents. So let me ask, how can I update one field of a document, one column in a, one row in the, in the database? Right, and the Convex AI bot replies that I need to use the DB patch method, and it gives me a concrete example. It follows the convention that we have in our docs. So if I asked GPT this, it probably wouldn't know. Convex is too new. It would probably try to infer something. It would hallucinate. It would not give the correct uh, reply. Uh, I can expand that just to see it more clearly. OK, so that's kind of the thing that we want to build. Um, and I think that example demonstrates the three reasons for building a custom chat app, right? Like the interface is right there in the docs where our users are already searching for answers. Uh, we prompted them specifically about Convex. So I didn't have to say, how do I update a document in Convex? Because we already know that we're inside of Convex. Um, and we're passing the documentation that's most relevant to the user's question to the LLM to form the answer. So. We didn't just build this once, this backend once. We actually built it three times. Um, so there's a new OpenAI Assistance API that is tailored to this particular use case. Uh, secondly, we implemented this using the LangChain library that's very popular. And third, we just implemented it kind of custom on our own. So before I dive into these three and talk about the trade-offs, let me just cover how the system works in, in general. So what we need to do to get this thing working is first to ingest the data and then to serve the incoming traffic. To ingest the data, we load some data. In our case, this is the documentation pages, but you know, it could be <laughs> offline documents. Uh, it could be the source code for our product. It could be something user specific. It can be, it can be anything. Um, optionally, we probably want to split it up to get more semantic chunks. Um, otherwise, we'll just get you know, one large document that covers a lot of things. And then for those chunks, we want to embed them. That means we want to uh, call or get an AI model 
to convert, to go from text uh, of that chunk to uh, just an array of floating point numbers. Um, and we can do this offline, we can do this once, we can do this before we launch, but probably we'll want to do this periodically, right? Because we are evolving our documentation, we are adding new features, and we want it to stay up to date. And then the second phase is the serving of the traffic. So we just opened uh, the chat, we send in the question, what happens then? Well, we take the question and perhaps any preceding conversation, we embed, we embed it. So we again call the model, we get another array of floating point numbers. And now that we have this array and that long list of arrays of floating point numbers, we can find the ones that are semantically the closest or the, in the case of the numbers, just the ones that are closest and that translates to semantic search. And then we can take those pieces, pieces of context and pass them to the LLM. And I think it might be more fun to see this in action as well. So um, here I have an instance of this backend. This is the convex dashboard. There's a lot of stuff here, but you know, we're gonna have four uh, tables here. Uh, I'm actually interested in the documents table. And there's nothing in here, but I have all the code. I have the implementation. So I also have a function, uh, which I called fetch single, that takes a single URL from our docs and does the first step. It loads the document, it parses it, it splits it up. So let me paste in the right URL and run the function. Right, so now I have a document uh, in the table. And because the document is long, it's split up into four chunks. I could see what that looks like. Yeah, it's just like a bunch of markdown that I parsed out of the HTML of the, of the web page. Um, but I don't have any embeddings yet. Uh, I actually split that up into a separate step because I want to run this uh, every, uh, every now and then. So let me just run the embed all. And now we called OpenAI, we got the embeddings, we store them back in our database. And now I can do basically the same thing that I was doing before from, from the UI, but I'll just do it here. So you can kind of see how I can test this out. Uh, and I can ask the same question, run this function. So uh, what this does is it creates a document for my message and then it creates a document for the AI bot for the, re for the response. And what you're seeing here is that it gets lifetime, uh, real time getting updated with the reply from OpenAI from the LLM. Cool. So let me go back here. So that's how the system works in general. How can we build this? How can we make this as simple as possible to build? Well, uh, the new OpenAI Assistance API is designed to do this. And it can actually do a good chunk of this whole flow for us. All we really need to do is we need to take our documents, whatever context data we want, and upload it to OpenAI. And then OpenAI just gives us an API that given the question, gives us an answer. So you might be wondering, wow, if OpenAI already has this, like, it, what is there for me to build? Do I even need a server? Can I just plug this to my, on my website and, and run that? Well, uh, you, you quite can't. Uh, you need, um, you don't want to expose your OpenAI API key. You need the API key, you don't want to expose it, so you want to store it on the server. Uh, we probably want to pre-process the data before we call OpenAI. Um, we might want to have the LLM invoke functions on our server, right? So some of the, like the example with, with the Amazon page that I was showing, maybe the LLM is going to trigger some action called on our server. And for a more sophisticated experience, we might want to pull in data real time from the database, like the product data. So um, it's great because we don't need to worry about the chunking and vector search. And you know, a benefit is that it might improve over time without us investing any, any engineering effort into it. And it does have other tools besides the context retrieval that kind of powers this example. It has code interpreter and function calling, the similar, similar stuff that you're uh, familiar with uh, from ChatGPT. But it is a black box, right? And the results might differ from what we're seeing. It might get worse, not better. Um, and we cannot really build anything more sophisticated once we have uh, the question because we don't control how the LM is being prompted. So we cannot create any chains there. Um, and of course, it will be much harder to move to a different API because it's unlikely that other providers will provide just this kind of API. So for these reasons, uh, we wanted uh, an implementation that we control more tightly. 
and we use Langchain. And Langchain is actually also designed to do this. Actually, the full thing is, is already included uh, in Langchain's docs. So it does, including the fetching from a website and loading of the data and the splitting and the embedding and the rest of the serving of the traffic portion. Uh, this is by far the shortest implementation of the three, uh, especially with the convex Langchain integration. It all runs on our backend. It talks to the LM for the embedding and uh, for answering the question. Um, and before, because Langchain abstracts all of this away from us, it, it uh, makes some choices for us. So for example, by default, uh, it actually does something that you would kind of not expect, right? You know that OpenAI has API for uh, having a conversation. So I can include a list of messages and it gives me the next message. Well, the default Langchain setup for this particular use case, use case doesn't actually use a conversation uh, as the last step. What it does is it takes the chat history and the question that's coming in and it calls an LLM to summarize it, to get a standalone question that doesn't need the chat history. And it uses that to find the context, right? Um, and then passes the context and that summarized question to the LLM. How well this performs really depends on how well that summarization step uh, happened, perhaps on the question that, that was asked and the LLM doesn't see the whole uh, conversation. So uh, I think, I don't know how many of you are like into this uh, drama, but Langchain is somewhat controversial and I spent some time thinking about why, why it's so controversial. And I think it has two kind of opposing goals. One is um, it's tried to make AI development more approachable, even for people who perhaps haven't coded that much. Um, and at the same time, it's trying to wrap and encapsulate and expose like very sophisticated AI use cases. Uh, and I think those kind of go against each other. And it means that once you're trying to do something else than what it's set up to do, it's, it's a bit hard. It's hard to get it to do the thing that you want it to do. Um, so like I said, it was the shortest implementation and we got that summarization step for free. Um, another big upside to Langchain, reason why people use it is because it abstracts away the individual LLM APIs. So if we wanted to switch from OpenAI to Anthropic, this would be very easy with Langchain. But it can be more complex than needed because we kind of don't control the implementation. Uh, configuring it can be tricky. And since we're writing our backend in TypeScript, we like the types to be correct and precise. And that's sometimes not the case with Langchain's TypeScript. OK, so uh, let's look at the last implementation. What if we want total control over it, right? Um, and I will, show, I will show just a little snippet of the implementation. Um, so this is the second phase, really, of the implementation. It's, it's, it's a single function, a piece of code that, that, um, uh, that runs after I ask the question. What does it do? Well, uh, it gets the messages for the current session. It looks at the last message. It embeds it by calling OpenAI. Um, we then search for uh, the embeddings that are closest to the one for the last message. We get those relevant document chunks. And we create a message for the AI chatbot where we're going to insert the answer, right? Because we're going to wait a little bit for the AI to reply. And then we call OpenAI. And here you can see that we have the prompt right here, exactly how we set it up. We can tune it however we want. We pass it the relevant documents, and we pass it the conversation, tagging which is from the user, which is from the assistant. This is all running on our server, on our backend. We can tune this code however we like. From OpenAI, we get a stream back, and then we kind of accumulate that stream into this text variable, and we write it through to the database. And how does the you know, answer appear for the user? Well, with Convex, uh, Convex is a reactive database. So all you do is you, uh, from the client, you say, hey, what are the messages for the current session? We return them. And as the messages update, uh, the client is being sent the updated messages. And that's, that's how they update. So with the custom implementation, we control the whole setup. And um, I would argue that with a platform like Convex, the custom implementation is really hard to beat because you have the full control and flexibility to set up the system in whichever way you like. 
and to make it you know as custom and as sophisticated as you want. And it really isn't that much more difficult uh, than the other two implementations. If you want to find out more, uh, go to stack.convex.dev or just convex.dev and find stack there. Um, there is a series of four articles, one article on each of these implementations. They, they walk through the whole code so you can kind of compare for yourself. Um, and there's also in each of them a link to the GitHub repo for each of them. So this is all open source. You can take it, you can play with it, you can expand it as you like. Um, and one more thing, uh, especially if you have a bigger team, we have a pretty generous free tier already uh, for Convex, but if you have a bigger team, if you want more usage, you can use the promo code AICAMP to get 30 days of our pro plan for free. It allows for bigger teams, more projects, more usage. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thanks a lot for listening. And I think Idan goes next. Oh, yeah. How much time do we have? I did not push down. Yeah, a couple minutes. You're good? No, no. Okay. Um, any questions? Hey, uh, thanks for um, the, the presentation. Um, how, uh, how can I use it in a way that it can perform things more like than, for example, a long chain AI agent builder? like? If I use your platform, do you? Uh, what are the specific the, um, the the advanced features that you have that will enable me, for example, to build uh, more um, uh, advanced and more sophisticated AI agents? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I I would have two answers to that. If you're trying to build more like a live agent that kind of reacts to the world outside and you know, takes its own actions. Uh, that's where the scheduling comes in uh, and also webhooks. So you could have webhooks that receive information from the outside and you can schedule actions into the future or periodically. Um, and the other answer is that if you build your product, uh, you know, using the convex database, then it's very easy to augment the AI app with the product information from the database. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Another question? Yeah, um, based on your presentation set, you said that there's some lot of your trier for using some of the like a chat open AI API and then the long chain and then you end up with the code implementation by yourself, right? So um, it means that like uh, those kind of previous trier is not getting the satisfied outcome for you, right? Then how much portion do you use for the, like uh, some generative AI by your services to understand about people's, like a uh, client's code and how much you manually implement it? How much is the portion of it? Uh, we don't use AI to like generate code our customers write code on top of convex kind of to use ai we this is really the only use case for ai that we have right now um and we had another like a slack bot which is also very interesting uh, that that was like commenting on people's support tickets um but i think you know we might do more of that in the future for sure uh more uses of ai uh internally as well um but we're right now focused on building out the the backend platform i see so yeah, actually like a the code needs some completeness that we can trust that like AI can generate the complete code, right? And then when you're doing some experiment, we end up with saying that AI, based on this like experiment, AI cannot creating the like a complete code yet, right? Mm. Oh yeah. So I did not. I kind of talked about the building phase of the pro project, but there is a big phase of evaluation, right? And kind of running mm -hmm. this this project in production. Um, we found that the custom implementation performed best in terms of uh, the replies that it gave to the questions, but it's definitely not something that, you know, we had a lot of time to spend to kind of tune that and optimize it. We're listening to the feedback from our uh, users, from our community, and seeing how well the bot performs. And so far, it seems to be uh, performing pretty well. It is using GPT-4 under the hood. Uh, one more thing I didn't talk about is um, 
you know, if you just expose GPT-4 out there, people might just use it because, you know, that's a paid feature from OpenAI. Um, but it's because we're providing it with specific context and we're telling it, hey, if the context doesn't give you the answer, don't answer, right? That's, that's another kind of thing that you might want to think about as you're building AI products that you can't just expose, uh, you know, an API publicly for a powerful model that actually costs us money to run, right? Awesome. Huge thanks to uh, Michael. Let's give it for a Next up, we have Aiden from GitHub. Well, it's not going to work. I need to see some slides. That's not going to work either. Hold on. All right, we're in business, technology, success. Hi, how you all doing? Good, have you heard about AI lately? It's so hot right now, right? So yeah, so reading all the breathless hype around AI, it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that it isn't magic pixie dust that you're gonna sprinkle on problems and get solutions, right? In fact, the idea that the average team could add AI to a product was nonsense, like three years ago, two years ago, right? It used to be that all AI was lovingly handcrafted by a tiny group of people with deep domain expertise, and each one had to be tailored to one specific application. But we've seen uh, two revolutions happen in the last decade, which has led to this Cambrian explosion of AI. And the first was the advent of deep learning, right? Which didn't make it easy, but it did replace a million different algorithmic approaches with one technique. Frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch lowered the barriers to implementation. Uh, and their popularity also meant that there was more documentation out there for, for helping newcomers to catch up. And the second was the broad availability of, of large language models. With LLMs, you don't need any particular skills to use machine learning. You take a generalized off-the-shelf model and you prompt it in plain English and magic happens. So we went from having a million different techniques uh, that only a few highly trained people uh, uh, can use to one technique that even school children can use, right? You can grab an API key and you can come up with a naive prompt and you can build a little demo that works some of the time, right? And that's exactly what's driving a lot of the hype because you can have something that you can show off in 10 minutes and take and demo and go ask a venture capitalist to fund. But demos are not products, right? Making a reliable product that delivers value means that you have to climb the rest of the mountain. And that mountain is not quite the same mountain we know from other software projects. Uh, it turns out that a lot of that mountain has a lot of unglamorous work that has nothing to do with AI, nothing at all. So my name is Idan. Hi, nice to meet you. And I'm one of the leads at GitHub Next, which is GitHub's research and prototyping group. 
uh, we figure out how to make risky business altering bets like what if an AI could help developers write code and it didn't suck. Um, so GitHub Copilot was one of the first products that we, first at scale products that we, that we uh, built on top of generative AI. And we've since gone on to prototype a lot of things, Copilot for PRs, Copilot for docs. Um, recently at Universe, we announced Copilot Workspaces, uh, Copilot CLI, really there's a whole lot of stuff, githubnext.com, check it out. Um, but we've gone on to prototype a lot of different uh, applications uh, for AI in service of software developers. The UX of Copilot by now is, is pretty common, right? You write a little bit, and Copilot does a pretty good job of suggesting what comes next as gray ghost text, right? Not autocomplete, but, but whole chunks of code. And a little over two years ago when we were first starting, or I guess three years ago when we were first starting Copilot, uh, or work on the thing that eventually became Copilot, there was almost no prior art. We didn't know how it should look. We didn't know how it should work. Uh, we didn't know how to measure and test it. Um, we didn't know how to make it good. So I'm gonna touch today on a few areas where we learned some important lessons and a little bit of outlook towards the future. So let's start with the user experience of AI, right? Every time we find a new technological medium, uh, we discover new basic mechanisms for it, right? When the iPhone first came out, uh, if you wanted to refresh what you saw on your screen, there was a button and you had to tap that button and apps had to make space for that button in order to trigger a refresh. Um, it wasn't until a full year later that the pull to refresh gesture was implemented or invented by Lauren Brichter, who wrote Tweety, which is the app that eventually became the native iOS Twitter app, right? And it took advantage of everyone's implicit understanding that that new content lived further up, right? Um, now, it didn't take long for both major smartphone platforms to ad adopt this as a, as a native gesture, um, alongside things like pinch to zoom. These were the first basic mechanisms of multi-touch screens. Uh, these UI devices that confer some form of mechanical advantage to the user, like a lever or a screw or a, a pulley. So now we have AI, and there will definitely be new basic mechanisms. Uh, I count three so far that I can sort of stick a label on, uh, and we're just at the start of this journey. So ghost text is for when you want to create and it's designed for maximum optionality, right? So you can explore different futures very, very quickly. Brushes, the idea of being able to paint transformations onto code in the same way that you would select some text and make it bold, right? Uh, and chat, which is designed for planning and iteration uh, because you can refine and refine until, until you get what you want. Now, three years ago, chat and brushes didn't exist. And we were focused on the, the basic problem of how do we present suggestions to users, right? And ghost text wasn't actually the first thing that we tried. The first thing that we tried was generating a list of 10 potential suggestions to accept. This is pulled straight from the archives. <laughs> we surfaced a lot of uh, options, different options at once, uh, which was helpful for showing you uh, a few different approaches. Um, but it came at literal cost we were incurring compute to eagerly generate suggestions two through 10 when most people chose the first one. Um, but the bigger problem was that it's modal, right? In order to use this, you have to stop typing, invoke Copilot, wait, and then browse the options. And then there's an executive function tax of like, well, which one should I, should I take home with me? Which puppy should I adopt? And if you decided you wanted to tweak your code first, you then had to back out entirely from this thing and repeat the whole process. So I wasn't that great. We also prototyped a sort of <clears throat> Tinder style, accept or reject, like not actual swiping, but like, you know, yes, I want it or no, I don't. Next, next, next option. Um, this lowered costs because we didn't need to eagerly generate all the things, but it was still very modal. You still needed to stop the activity of coding and switch to evaluation mode. And that's a lot of disruption for a developer that's in the flow of creation. So we ended up with ghost text and we didn't invent this mechanism. I'm pretty sure there were like short 
snippets of uh, ghost text and Gmail at this point, although they were like a few words long. It's like, hi, you know, nice to meet you. That, that level of, that scale of suggestion. Um, this was the right call for a product like Copilot for a few reasons. First, um, it's ignorable and it's modeless, which sounds weird to say, right? Like, I want my product to be ignorable, not actually something that you hear fairly often. Um, but in this context, it's actually super important. You can wait for suggestions to appear, or you can keep typing. And if you don't like the suggestion, you don't need to cancel anything. You can just keep typing. And if you type a little more, then you might improve your chances of getting a better suggestion because you're giving the model more clues about where it is that you want to go. And finally, being modeless reduces the friction to accept and edit, meaning if I like part of the suggestion, not, not the entire thing. Uh, it's easier for me to accept that suggestion and immediately tweak it because my cursor is right there and my fingers are on the keyboard uh, where a more modal acceptance might be demanding more commitment from me, early commitment from the user. But most critically, ghost text is a kind of hedge against suggestion quality, right? Models are getting better, fast. Um, uh, we might not be far off from a future where most suggestions are spot on. Um, but today, that isn't the case. We need to design for the, for the failures, suggestions that are completely wrong, or suggestions that are partly wrong, suggestions that are distracting because I didn't want them right now. If you don't make your UX forgiving, then you're effectively betting on your ability to get great results from the model. Um, and sometimes that's fine, but for a lot of applications, you can't assume that level of reliability today. The nice part about the sort of defensive design is that it's also inherently future-proof. Uh, the same UX will be great when your hit rate goes up on suggestions, uh, and it'll become a kind of safety net. Like, you know, like, oh, rarely my model gives me, you know, hot garbage. Okay, that's fine. I have a safety net. It's not, it's not a huge cost to reject the suggestion. I have less to say about the other two basic uh, mechanics as they're quite a bit newer. Um, with brushes, you can select some code and say things like add comments or fix the bug, right? But it's also a, a very powerful vehicle for interactions that play to the strengths of AI, right? There's no heuristic engine that will understand me if I ask it to make this form more accessible. Right, um, But that's exactly the sort of fantasy that was waiting for AI to happen. I would like to add accessibility right here. So if ghost text prioritizes the needs of creation, let's say brushes is all about transformations, as much as we talk about writing code and the generative part of generative AI, maintenance is a much bigger part of the job of software engineering. Right. Uh, so when I think about the kinds of interaction patterns we need to focus on as the field of AI matures, it's the ones that deal with mutation of existing code that I'm thinking about the most. And chat. I'd argue that the core of chat is about iteration. You can ask the model for something. And if what you get back isn't quite right, you can refine. Uh, it's a little bit like database transactions. I can try stuff and commit or roll back. And that refinement offers a ton of flexibility. Um, you don't need to figure out how to elicit desires from the user because they're just going to tell you what they want. But on the flip side, you're dumping part of the um, prompt crafting problem onto the user. And in our experience, good prompts are the, the biggest factor, the leading coefficient in delivering value. So do you trust your users to be good at articulating what they need? I've spent the last few years getting a feel for the models and how to make them cough up a useful response. It's easy to assume that our users have also acquired this field by now, but I think that's a dangerous assumption. Prompts matter. Uh, and this might be a short-term problem. GPT-3.5 and GPT-4 are, are pretty adept at interpreting even poorly phrased requests. Um, but I think the most interesting aspect about chat is the statefulness of it, the persistence of context. Right now, each conversation is an island. <clears throat> because prompt windows are still measured in, in kilobytes of tokens. Um, what happens in the future where every conversation 
uh, can be aware of all previous conversations. That's not that far off. If I'm building chat into my product, I want to think about how I'm making that history useful to users. And for now, maybe that's limited to sort of clever use of free prompt space to include relevant chunks of history using retrieval, whatever. But we're really just at the, the top of the discovery cycle here. If, if you showed blue underlined text to someone else in 1993, holla, other dinosaurs, um, uh, they wouldn't understand the meaning of that, right? But a decade later, you could assume that they'd understand that blue underlined text meant this is a hyperlink, right? And if I click it, I'm going to go to where it links to. Uh, we're in the middle of that transition with AI. There are new interactions out, new interaction patterns out there that are, are waiting for us to discover them. And more of them become possible with every passing year as everybody becomes more familiar with sort of the language of interaction. The core challenge, uh, to my mind, now sort of with a more forward-facing look, is breaking past the suggestion ceiling. Copilot works and is so popular because it's not suggesting that much code, right? It's suggesting uh, enough to be useful, but not overwhelming. Um, and that suggestion is happening right under your cursor in the file that you already had loaded into your brain. Uh, and as soon as you try to generate more, you try to generate a lot more code, um, then you start to run into two problems. First, the more code you try to generate, the more likely you are to get hot garbage back from the model, right? Um, there's no steering step in the middle to make sure that the model actually goes in the direction that you, you want it to. You're betting the entire house on every hand. Um, but the bigger problem as we scale suggestion size is the human one, right? Suggestions right here under my cursor are easiest to evaluate. Suggestions over there, less easy to evaluate. Suggestions all over my code base, suddenly the evaluation task is not a low cognitive load kind of process. It's like reviewing an entire pull request. So when I think about reaching for the next wave of AI experiences, I'm thinking a lot about steerability and reviewability. Otherwise, you're just trapped below the suggestion ceiling. You're trapped suggesting things that are at most this big. One pattern that I think about a lot is something I like to call the magic mirror pattern, meaning I can have two surfaces that I can mutate and they sync up with each other live. Um, so maybe I type on the right and on the left, AI is explaining what I'm doing. But that explanation is not just for me to read. It's uh, I can switch to editing that explanation and it will automatically update the code or the terminal or whatever artifact that I'm working on. Um, this sort of live feedback is great at small suggestion scales, but it can also be the surface that enables the larger suggestions. For example, if I just edited one file and the model can figure out, or I can figure out how to ask the model to figure out for me, what I'm likely to do next. Uh, I can use the magic mirror to surface those next steps and say, yes, please go ahead and do that for me. Or I could customize those descriptions, uh, giving the model a nudge in the right direction. Um, either way, instead of spitting it out as a huge suggestion uh, that I then need to pick apart and understand, it's progressively doing the work at a pace that I can oversee and understand. It's not forcing me to carry the entire task around in my head. And it also affords the user whatever interface they need. If I don't know what I want to do, I can start by writing the explanation, which will also work, which could also work in a chat context, um, or you could prime the models by writing the comments into your code. But I, I think that there's something to this sort of magic mirror interface that's it's gonna be interesting. And we're definitely looking at that. Um, at Universe, we also showed off bits of Copilot workspaces. If you didn't see it, check out the keynote, um, which is a separate take on how we synthesize code at larger scale. With workspaces, you start by querying your code base, like describe how my login flow works, right? And it produces a spec that describes that lo login flow in English. And then, uh, you know, that spec is maybe like, first you have to render the login form, and then you have to wait for it to be submitted, and then you hash the password and compare it with the stored hash, whatever. That's the first round trip to the model, right? That query. Um, but here, the spec itself is editable. Say you wanted to add a password reset mechanism. Then you just add that bullet point to your spec describing the future that you want. And when you're happy with the spec, you hit go, and it uses the changes that you made in the spec 
to formulate a plan of how to make those changes. That's the second round trip to the models. And so now you have a detailed plan, like we need a new route for handling the password resets and a database migration for storing the temporary reset token or whatever. And again, that plan is editable. So if the models didn't do a perfect job or they forgot about the database migration, um, you have an opportunity to course correct, to tell the model, no, actually a, a little to the left. And it's only when you accept the plan that we actually talk to the models to generate the full diff, right? Uh, but by the time you do that, it's no longer like shooting from the hip. The users had a lot of moments to steer towards the outcome they want. Now, I don't know what to call this pattern, the round trips pattern, but it's clearly a way to climb above the suggestion ceiling and more fluidly move back and forth between natural language and code. Whatever UI pattern you choose, some of your product considerations won't be about modality, but about latency. Everybody's excited for the power of the latest models, but they can also be very slow. Uh, we'll see how four turbo changes the game. The bigger, newer models are not always better, right? Very often you have to make trade-offs of acceptable latency versus power. We couldn't use something like GPT-4 for ghost text because it's just too slow. So part of the mountain of work is figuring out which models uh, it makes sense to use where. It might be about latency or it might be about actual dollar cost. Sometimes it's possible to invent, invest more energy into prompt crafting and try to squeeze an acceptable level of response out of the models, a cheaper model. Uh, there's a ton of levers to try pulling. And speaking of prompt crafting, the largest rabbit hole that you can go down is making changes to your product in order to elicit useful context from users that you can use for prompt crafting. So if I add a to-do list to my product, I'm probably adding very little value, right? There's a million to-do lists out there. I'm not gonna make a better one. But the point is to use that information somewhere. The text that you write into your to-dos, when you check one off, that's a semantically meaningful event that I can use to prime the models, to prompt the models. Um, that to-do list maybe doesn't look like an AI feature, but it might be the thing that makes the great AI experience possible somewhere else in your product. The problem is that this grows your solution space to infinity, right? Changing the product itself is a bottomless rabbit hole of options. So we talked a little bit about UX, now let's talk about prompts. Uh, people use prompt crafting and prompt engineering interchangeably, but I think there ought to be a, distinct, a distinction. There are strategies for crafting the template of your prompts like Mad Libs, but this is like a huge topic, not gonna talk about this. In our experience, a large part of the mountain of work is Prompt engineering, how do you gather and prepare the information that you want to use, gathering it ahead of time? I'll give an example from Copilot. Models predict what comes next. What if the insertion point is in the middle of some code? Uh, what if some code above references some code below? Uh, well, we had to engineer a just-in-time way to restructure the code in semantically sound ways before we send it off to the models. Um, this isn't rocket science. You know, everybody's encountered tree, tree sitter and uh, bash their head against it, but it had a huge impact on the reliability of results that we got back from the models. Because um, if you show the models garbage, you're going to get garbage back. Um, of course, everybody's excited about retrieval as a technique, and we are too. It's cheaper than fine tuning. Uh, it solves the cut -off, knowledge cutoff date problem. But I think the thing that's underappreciated with retrieval is that it makes it easier to cite your sources. When we made Copilot for Docs, uh, we stuffed the prompt window full of relevant source documentation. And then we had an easier time connecting the outputs from the models back to the facts that they, they rested upon to give users confidence in, in what came out that it's not a hallucination. But I think the most important aspect of retrieval is definitely how it helps you no matter what model you're using. Older models tend to have smaller prompt windows. Uh, you have to choose wisely. Larger models, you're not getting the maximum benefit unless you're stuffing the prompt context full of information. Looking further out, it's not just retrieval. The future is looking like multiple round trips with multiple models. Uh, we'll end up with like routes where models choose which models are downstream of them. Um, yes, it's slow and it's expensive today. Maybe not in the future. OK, so we talked about UX and we talked about prompts. The last topic is measurements. You're going to be trying things out because trial and error is a big part of the nascent discipline of AI today. How do you know if what you made is good? A huge mountain of 
a chunk of the mountain of work is how do you set up automated evaluation of what you're building? Um, you change your prompt crafting, your modeling. How do you know if it's performing? The problem is that the models are non-deterministic. How it works on my laptop means nothing. So you have to try it out on your users, but you'd like some smoke tests before that. Um, so in our case, we built an automated evaluation harness. There's lots of projects on GitHub with, that are public with a test suite. So we just built something at scale that blanked out function bodies uh, and then regenerated them and ran the test suite. And then any one run doesn't matter, but at scale, it actually tells you, is it performing better? Is it performing worse? And once the product is out there, what do you measure? What matters? So for Copilot, we know the suggestions are accepted or rejected. But even if they're accepted, it's not binary. How much of the suggestion are they accepting, right? Um, so cool, I have a chart for acceptance rate at, at 30 seconds, at one minute, at five minutes, at 10 minutes. But maybe these metrics are different by language. Are Python developers uh, getting more suggestions that they like than Haskell developers? I mean, it stands to reason. One is more popular than the other. OK, so now I have the combinatoric explosion of time and language. But maybe it's also about latency, like how far am I from where inference is happening? So now I have that combinatoric explosion. It's a lot. And measuring that, figuring out how to measure that is one of the hardest parts. Right now with AI, we're like in the early days of television. Back then, the dominant form of entertainment was the radio drama, right? That's what existed. And in the beginning, they didn't know how to do television. So they just took the cameras and they stuck them in the same room with the performers from the radio dramas. And they were just sitting around reading the radio dramas. And like they popped a balloon to make the gunshot when somebody got murdered or something, right? Um, you probably don't want to bolt AI onto the side of your thing, like sticking a camera in the room with the radio performers. It's a lot of trial and error to figure out the right interfaces, to acquire the right data, to measure, and to do all this unglamorous work to know if what you're doing is good. Um, but that's the mountain that you're signing yourself up to climb if you're pursuing these kinds of products. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I can do questions later. OK, we will do questions for him later after all the talks. Thank you. Next up, we have Sebastian from BB8. Should be good. Quick preparation. Here we go. Check, check. You, can you hear me? How's it going? You all excited? Ready to fall asleep or uh, ready for some action? Yeah, action. There we go. Um, yeah, if you are as excited as me, you can join the Wivy Vector Club, you know. Uh, it's a good club, uh, there's loads of fun people, you know, it could be one of us. I got a huge bag of stickers as well, and uh, we have some contests coming up, uh, a prize coming up, so it's going to be fine. It's going to be fun. So I've given this talk a uh, few times, and I started seeing some familiar faces, so I decided to change the slides. So if you see me lost at some point, that's probably because I'm uh, trying out new stuff and everything, but it's all good stuff anyway. So my name is Sebastian. I'm the head of DevRel at Weaviate. I build cool she, uh, stuff, uh, so uh, it's all good. Um, and I love to share the stuff that, that we build at Weaviate and in general. And actually working with multimodal is one of those examples. Um, so in case you haven't joined the Lucky Draw yet, this is still a good time to check the QR code. I'll show it one more time. The Lego set is pretty awesome. Um, if you love it, it's uh, Adam's idea. He's at the front with me, so it should be all good. 
All right? All right. Cool. And uh, one more thing. So if you want to learn more, more about like vector databases and um, the, like where the vector embeddings come from and how to build with them, I actually be, uh, created a course uh, that was published on deep learning AI. It, it takes about an hour. Um, just a cool thing, like when you watch it, think of it that I had a high fever whilst recording it. And everybody thinks like, oh, you, you had so much energy. I was so dead inside, trust me. <laughs> but the chorus came out okay, so I, I recommend going through it. All right, so let's get to the essence of my talk. So here's an interesting thing, like if you think of it when we're growing up or if you observe your kids or your nephews or like kids in general, like how do they learn? Do they learn through explanations and through words or do they actually learn in many other ways right like do they learn through touch through sound through like uh, you know tasting something you know like actually all the kids are just trying to bite out everything lick everything right and it's it's pretty much the thing right like the, how we interact and how we learn from the ground up uh, we are multimodal right so why do we think that um, LLMs should be limited to learning from text, right? The future is multimodal, if you think of it. Um, and that's kind of like where, where the promise of multimodality comes from, where there's models out there that can already do that, that I can look at text, but all, all the other stuff. I don't think multimodal models can taste things just yet, but uh, I'm pretty sure we can get there. So. The whole idea is that we should be able to look at things like language, image, audio, video, sensors, all sort of types of the data, and then kind of like pass it into various multimodal uh, models that can generate embeddings or provide a generative response so that we can interact with it. You know, like uh, we could uh, try it out with sarcasm and humor or use it with robots or try to encode disease, diseases, et cetera, right? And be able to dive deeper, right? So it's not just about high level text, but what can we do with those models? And here's an interesting thing, and there's already been some tests, uh, you can check out those links, that you could digitize smells. So you could even like uh, define like uh, where the musk smell or lily smells or how does cabbage smell and explain it to a machine learning model uh, so that later on, if you have some other sensors, they could tell you like, oh, this smells good or this smells like not so good. <laughs> um, and that's sort of the idea. And if also there's a question of like, how do we train those multimodal models? Like, what is the idea? And so I want to use the example from ImageBind from Meta. Uh, and they did something very interesting. So the ImageBind from Meta can actually deal with text, depth, audio, video. Uh, there's heat maps. IMU is just like for kinetic motion and all sort of things. So how do they train it so that the model is able to uh, understand it in, in many different ways and also point you always in the same direction, regardless of the input type? So what I did, they first trained on one modality. They trained it, they trained an image and video, uh, and video uh, model. And then after that, uh, they, they started training all the adjacent models so that text could point at the same kind of a modality space so that heat maps, depth, et cetera. And then by doing that, they were able to actually transition so that all the models were kind of like related to each other and not just working from text to image, but every modality to every modality. And if you think of it by doing that, we are able to unify everything into a single unified vector space, right? So, so then you can deal with images and text and, and videos and all those modalities in one space and it, all of it is understood in the same way. And the kind of like, this is a pretty cool example that straight away shows you that the model itself could have multiple encoders. However, as you pass them on, the vector embeddings that get generated are the kind of very similar. So whether you have a description of a lion or a lion roar, or you have a picture or a video of lions running, the embeddings are very, very similar. So that's how we can actually match them. So by looking at this, we can see it's like, yes, this model really understands it, uh, that these different modalities kind of point in the same, di same direction. Um, and that pretty much enables us to, for example, search across all of it. So regardless of what we pu pu uh, put in as an input, regardless of the type, we can point at a specific space in the 
in a vector space, and then as a response, we can get all those modalities back. So you can search any to any. You could use an audio file uh, to search for text files or, or videos, etc. And uh, this is very, very powerful, and it works really well. And that also opens up a lot of interesting opportunities, right? So of course, we can search across all, um, uh, all different types of modalities. I talked about it. Uh, but we could also look at arithmetics, right? So what if happens if I add an image plus audio and then search for images using that? Or maybe I could even use audio to describe something and then pass it into a generative model so that it can generate uh, the response to us. So it doesn't have to be a text to generate the output. It could be actually uh, one of those modalities that comes out of it. So in summary, large language models, they're pretty awesome, they're pretty cool. But large multimodal models, yeah, that's the, that's the thing. That's basically what we are all after. And uh, this is super powerful. So I want to see if I can show you how this works in action. Um, how are we doing on time? I'm trying. To, yeah, all good. All right. So what I want to do first is, before I do very quick multimodal demo, I, I want to just show you the basics of search, maybe make it a little bit bigger. So just to show you the, the, the basics and the core understanding of how everything works. So I'm using Wivit for this. I work at Wivit, surprise. Um, so I'm basically connecting to an instance of Wivit. In this case, I'm using an embedded version, which runs directly within my machine. And I have this data file of like a thousand objects. Uh, right now, it's just a, a text object. So let me load this file and I'm, I put it into this uh, array of data 1K. And what I can do really with Wivy is I need to create a collection where I can drop all that data in. And then, so I'll call this collection questions. I'm not gonna do a lot of typing. This is going to be the only typing for this, but I can actually choose the type of vectorizer I wanna use. So I could send it to AWS Bedrock or use Azure OpenAI or Palm, Hugging Face, all sort of different ones. So I'm going to use text to vector OpenAI. Um, and then also on top of that, I'm configuring a generative model to also use GPT-4 with this collection. So if I run this, this creates an empty collection for me. And what I can do is if I grab this collection, I can just call insert many, drop those 1,000 objects I just loaded from that JSON file. And this is a very interesting what's happening right now. We are not only inserting these objects in, but also Wivy goes like, oh, you're using OpenAI. Let me take these objects and vectorize them. So that's why this is uh, taking about, what, 15? It should take under 20 seconds, depending on the Wi-Fi in general. But once this is done, basically, we'll have 1,000 objects vectorized inside Wivy 8. Huh. Usually this, this takes 20 seconds, so I, and, and I, I don't usually run out of things to say. Okay, 35 seconds, this is all vectorized. So we could get a very quick preview of what's inside. So these are our objects that sit inside Wivy8. That's pretty cool. And if I add include vectors, we could even preview our vector embeddings. So you could see like for the first few objects, the vector embeddings are already here. And then having that, what I can do we can start querying. So the most basic query we can run is something like this, where I could just call, hey, all my questions near text, looking for musical instruments. And if I search for this, this finds all sort of objects uh, that match the, the, the query that I'm looking for. And I will skip a whole bunch of examples because I want to get to multimodal. But the really cool thing that I can do, if I add a single prompt to it, uh, I can actually pass it to GPT-4. So first, I'm running query, looking for musical instruments. And then for every object that I get back, I'm telling GPT-4, hey, write a short tweet about this. And, and here we have a bunch of tweets. So this is the output that came from the query. And this is a generated tweet that came from GPT-4. And that's pretty much like the essence of um, what we did that, that's at the core. Um, so let me get to the multimodality because this is the really exciting thing that you all came here for. So this time, what I do is I'm actually running uh, this instance directly on my laptop with uh, Docker Compose. And for this demo, I am using an image bind 
from Meta model, uh, which is already running on my machine. So I can connect to our data set, and you can see using uh, image bind, I have a collection called animals. And for this, what I want to really do is this. I have a bunch of images. So I have like some cats, dogs, meerkats. Meerkats are my spirit animals. So every demo you see from me, you see demos of meerkats. But also I have some videos of like cats, meerkats again, and dogs. Oh, yeah, this one is a cool one. Look at them dig. Look at them go, you know? Let's see uh, if the vector database can actually understand it or if we can vectorize it. So what I can do is I already have a collection. And in order to pass uh, those images, audio, or video files, I basically need to convert them into base64 format. So I have this special function that given the file, I can co convert them. So basically in this code, I just go here and say, OK, grab all the images from that file and then loop through them. And then for every image, we basically just construct a JSON object so that later on I know what was the name, what was the path. But here is the data that I pass in for vectorization, right? It's just taking our file and then convert to base64. And if I run this, I basically run it every, every five objects. Uh, I basically send them into Wivy to vectorize with image bind. And the cool thing is that I'm actually running it directly on my laptop, right? So I don't have NVIDIA card. Otherwise, uh, this would take uh, like a half a second, but still. I just vectorize a bunch of images. Um, I have like 15 pic, uh, uh, files here. I pre-vectorize also the videos. Videos take longer. I also have a bunch of audio files. So I can also, similar way, just go insert them uh, batch by batch. And we have right now 21 files. And then with this, I'm going to skip the videos. We can start playing with query, right? So a multimodal search, I'll skip this part, this part, this part. A multimodal search is pretty much like this. I can, for example, call, hey, query near text, and I'm going to look for a dog with a stick. And if I search for this, what happens is the dog with stick gets sent into image bind saying like, hey, convert this into a vector embedding. And then using this embedding, we'll search across all our documents. And what do we get back? Well. We get a video of a dog with a stick running around. We also get, let's see, do I have audio? <coughs> dog barks. And then we have like a, a picture of a dog. What next we can do also is, what if we take an image and pass it as an input? So I have this image of a kitty. I'm a dog person, but I, I accept cats in my demos. That's fine. You know, I'll survive. I'll swallow it for once. Um, but I can actually take the image as an input and then again, we get in response other images of, the, of, of cats. And then fine, well, not fine necessarily. I also have another audio, another barking audio. So I kind of expect uh, responses to be barks, running dog, and then you have another dog. And then finally, uh, we have a video. So this one is kind of slowest because vectorizing a video on my laptop directly is kind of slow, but I'll kick it off. And it's a similar process, right? We passed in a video as a base64 format that gets vectorized, and that's how we run search. But you could pretty much see that the code required to do a multimodal search is pretty straightforward. All you do is just saying, I am looking based on this. And you can get responses in any type of modalities. So passing a video can return text documents, audio, et cetera, anything that we have in our database. So I pass in a video of Meerkat. Well, I, we get Meerkat's back. How cool is that? Oh, isn't he cute? And this is pretty awesome, right? Like, it doesn't really take that much effort. And of course, like, a big part of the, the job is done by a multimodal model that enables us uh, to do stuff like this. Cool, let's continue on. And I have one more demo to come, which is also super cool. So this is cool. Yeah, so this is pretty cool because we can use uh, multimodal models to do search, but we could take it even a step further, right? What if we were able to actually use the search to find the resources we need to pass it into a generative model, and then in fact, kind of like try to build a multimodal model? Because let's face it, a picture is worth a thousand words. 
So why do we just focus on using text to, for our generative models? So basically what we can do in, in RAG is again, make a query to our vector database and then uh, retrieve any objects that are relevant to the query. And then we can take that with a prompt and then pass into an LLM to generate something in return. And that's basically what we call uh, multimodal RAG. So I'll run this super fast demo not without explaining too much of what's exactly happening, but using uh, the, the data that, we'll, that we already have. So the first step basically, I'm calling retrieve image and I'm looking for dog with a sign and that just uses the, the previous near text query as you saw before. So in response, we get this super cute uh, puppy that uh, calls for free kisses. And what I do is just, I, I grab this, the source image from that response. So I, I use with it for a retrieval. I search for, for a picture of a dog. And given that source image, what we can do is uh, pass it into GPT-4 vision. And you can see like we'll be passing this base image here. And what we can really do is say, okay, given this source image, we are also providing a prompt. So saying like, hey, this is an image of my pet. Please give me a cute and vivid description. So vision will be able to actually using this prompt and will analyze what's on the picture, give us a really nice description, uh, which describes pretty well the picture. So this image captures uh, an absolutely adorable French bulldog. I agree. So then finally, uh, in the interest of time, I'll move on. If we take this gendered description, we can pass it into DALI. And if we pass that description into DAL, into our query, uh, we could kind of like close the loop. So from retrieval to generate a description, to do something further, and then finally we should be able to get something back uh, as a generated image. So let's see what DALI can come up with. And we get this super cute doggo back. How cool is that, right? This is pretty awesome. And um, that's basically what we call multimodal rack uh, in, in, in general. And there's many other ways that you can apply uh, this kind of techniques. And, um, but in, in short, if you look at it, like the end-to-end -end the code just is, is like these three steps. Retrieve your resources, maybe generate a description. You could do some other stuff in between and then finally pass it into another generative model to change some, something back. And there's a lot, a lot we, that we can really do. So to wrap up, so if you're curious, this is a, this, uh, we have some resources. Uh, if you want to learn about Weaviate, there's some quick start. Uh, we have a pretty cool blog post that talks about multimodal rack. And then whether, if you're a Python developer, the, the, work, the examples I was going through is part of that multimodal workshop. If you're a JavaScript developer, I build an app with Node.js and Angular. So that's the multi 2 vec bind.js. Uh, you can definitely check. And if you haven't uh, joined the, the prize just yet, this is final chance, um, but I won't be taking much more time. Thank you for your time. Let's hear it for Sebastian. We are going to skip questions because you can uh, talk to them after all the talks. And yeah, I can vouch for VV8 blogs. Personally, supported a lot to learn RAG. So please check out their blogs for sure. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. Next up, we have Gur Singh from Code Rabbit. need to kind of and you can put it in the back pockets. 
All right, good luck. Thank you. Okay, hi folks. Uh, my name is Gur Singh. I'm a co-founder at Code Rabbit. So with uh, Code Rabbit, we are uh, improving the code review process. Talking about the uh, code reviews, as industry, we understand the code reviews are critical, extremely important. And at the same time, uh, as a developer, we understand the pain points that are come part of the, uh, the the review process. So that's what we are working on. So Code Rabbit is an AI powered code reviewer that provides a. Just try to do this, speak louder. Can you hear me? You guys hear me? Can you hear me now? Is it better? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So code Rabbit is an AI powered code reviewer that uh, provides a context aware line by line review feedback uh, with the chat feature that uh, gets smarter over time the more you use it. Get into the features, uh, key features of uh, Code Rabbit. It does automated continuous reviews of the pull request as the pull request gets uh, created. Uh, along with the incremental commits as additional commits are made on the PR. First, it does a, a summarization of the PR. It creates a, a non-technical high-level summary, uh, which is intended for the entire team, technical and non-technical folks. And along with that, it creates a technical walkthrough of uh, all the all the code changes which are part of the PR. And that's essentially meant for like all the peer reviewers. Besides the summarization, it does a review of uh, each and every diff that's part of the pull request. When it does the review, uh, if there are any actionable suggestions, those are posted as the review comments around the code diffs. And uh, those suggestions can be committed with a single click within the PR. It goes beyond the, uh, the pull request. It does a code, uh, code based verification by which it verifies the impact of the chain set on the overall code base and identifies any, uh, any missing changes. For instance, if there is a code which is getting changed, it's being referenced in some other uh, area of the code within the same repository, so it'll, it'll point that out. It also does deep insights by which uh, uh, you can ask any questions on your code base uh, within the pull request comments. And I'll, 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 go, I'll go over those examples. Then uh, it supports conversations. You can uh, chat with the bot around your code. So it's like a chat GPT session, but it has the context of, of, of your code changes. It has a context of your repository. It has the context of your preferences. And the, the more uh, you chat, the smarter the bot gets. It also does a first uh, level of uh, validation of the pull request against the linked issues. So generally when a pull request is created, it's, the intent is it's, it's fixing some issue, whether it's a GitHub issue, a GitLab issue. We have integrations with the linear Jira. So part of the review, it does the first level validation, the, the review, uh, the validation results assessment is posted within the PR. That gives a pretty good sense on whether the PR is in the right direction or not. And along with that, it also identifies all the uh, related issues that might be impacted by the changes within the pull request. So I guess, yeah, let's get into some of these examples. Uh, are the screenshots visible in the back? So this is uh, generally how like the, the review comments are posted. Let's go over there. So 
for instance, over here, uh, the, the bot left a review comment where it suggested that uh, this channel kicker.run should, should really be running in a separate thread. And then uh, within the pull request, a peer review uh, noticed and agreed on the change and it copied the, uh, the, the author of the PR. And it goes beyond that, it does a, a code-based verification. So with this, it looks for the impact of the changes within the pull request in the larger code base. So in this example, if we see the, uh, in this function, there's additional parameter which, which was added. So CodeRab, it did the review of that. And in that, it, it identified that the change is correct. That's, that's what the intent of the PR was. But along with that, it also identified other files which are using the same method, which need to be updated as well. So it, uh, it mentions this uh, repositories.go, which is using the same method, but uh, it's passing the log parameter instead of the database string. And this is a new feature which we actually uh, which we uh, shipped just last weekend. We're calling it Deep Insights. So with this, within the pull request conversations, you can essentially ask any questions about about your code repositories. So over here, for instance, I asked the question like, uh, "Give me some more insights on the commits in the last two weeks. Give me five most uh, modified files." Uh, which your uh, bot did, it, it provided the files and it also mentioned like some of the anomalies as well. The first uh, line was changed one out 102. Uh, the first line had 102 changes, which seemed to be anomaly. And this is how the, the conversations work. So in, in this case, the bot left a review comment. It suggested that uh, like if you're disabling a shell check warning, just make sure that it's not being used anywhere else in the code. And with that, you add some, uh, some comments so that it's clear to the other, other users. So the developer said that uh, that was not the intention, but they don't really know how to, how to find a solution for that. I don't know how to declare a shell check source declaration. So disabling is not needed. Can you propose a solution? And uh, right after that, the, the bot provided the, uh, the, the solution. So this, the next piece is uh, uh, the code rabbit learnings. So with this, uh, when the review feedback is posted, like if you are if you're using large language models that not really fine tuned for the individual uh, code repositories, but uh, for that we have Code Rabbit learnings with which uh, the user can uh, interact with the bot. They can leave a suggestion for the bot, and uh, in future the bot will learn from that and it will improve the review feedback. So in this case, uh, the bot left the comment that uh, this uh, environment variable, uh, like the two things, one is that the it's not following the standard, the name that it should be used. And then secondly, there is, uh, there is not a check for like a null check for this variable. So to this, the developer left a comment that uh, this TMP is always set in the Docker image from the Docker file itself. And once the, once the developer left this uh, feedback, after that the bot learns and in future the, the bot will not leave the same comment again on the same code base. And one thing which is really important here is that uh, it keeps the learnings up to date. So over a period of time, the facts change, coding styles change, coding practices change for the teams. So it can, with that, it, it actually removes the learnings as well, which are not relevant anymore. 
So when it leaves a feedback, once the developer tells that we, we started using a different pattern, then it, it removes those learnings from, uh, from its database. And then uh, the, I guess the next feature is this uh, issue validation. So with this, uh, when the pull request is reviewed, uh, part of the walkthrough section, we leave uh, this comment with the assessment against the linked issue. This is like a first level validation whether the pull request met the intent or not. And it, it mentions whether the issues are addressed which were not really addressed and the ones which it's not sure about. And uh, along with that, it displays all the related issues, all the related open issues which might be impacted by the, uh, by the code changes. So if there are, for instance, if there are duplicate issues or if the developer missed linking an issue when creating a PR. So it, it displays all the issues and in addition, it also helps in case if there is a code which is frequently getting changed, there's a brittle code which which is broken often. So it, it, it shows like these are the issues which were fixed in, in the last like two months around this uh, same, same piece of code. That's all the features. Uh, this is some of our, our clients will use our product. Uh, the, the way to sign up for it is we have a free trial. You go to Code Rabbit AI website and uh, there's no credit card needed. Uh, within a few clicks, you have the app installed on GitHub or GitLab repositories. And once the app is installed, it starts listening to the different events that happen on the repository. When the pull request is created, additional, uh, additional commits are being made. If the issues are create, getting created, if the issues are getting updated, uh, the reviews are free forever on public uh, repositories. Uh, and we have a free uh, access for one month. Sorry. So generally the free trial is for seven days, but uh, with this uh, coupon code, you get uh, access for, uh, for, for one month to the pro subscription. So I guess what next I can jump into is show some of the real reviews. So if we go to uh, GitHub, we can actually uh, search for all the reviews that CodeRabbit has made on the public repos. So if you see, like we, we have reviewed um, about 25,000 pull requests. And this is like all public data. You can uh, go in and, and check the reviews for yourself. I guess what next we can do is maybe look at some of these uh, public uh, repository reviews. So let's, let's look at this PR, for instance. So for, uh, for this PR, enhancements and refactoring for uh, ESLint compliance. So this is like the high level summary that uh, gets generated. It's added to the PR description. And then there is a Sure. There's a walkthrough comment that, that gets added, uh, which uh, in natural language explains which files were changed and what changes were in those files. And then there is a assessment against the linked issues if there is an issue linked with the PR.
and this is how the uh, the, the comments are left and how the, the the developer would engage so over here if we see uh, the comment was left and the developer said uh, do you have any suggestions uh, and then it uh, the board provided the suggestion and then it, the developer said that this specific that they don't like to do things that way but um, can you can you log a github issue and then it it created a context like the entire content for the github issue developer created the issue to fix that uh, in future so that's like that's the like typical workflow so for instance this talks about code base verification the uh, the developer made a change they changed the port number but they, they they missed changing it in one of the files in the repository and the bot left a review comment that uh, there is a file which is still using the old port number Just one more. Yeah, so this, yeah, this is the last thing. So this is about like how you can uh, query uh, your repository, all the commits or all the changes that have been made on the repository. So for instance, over here, uh, ask like, give me the three most mod uh, modified files in, in, in the last week. And, and it did that. And it also explains how it, get, how it got to those results. Like what are the files that uh, uh, the script files that it ran? Yeah, that's that's all. I'm out of time. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Thank you. Thank you, Gur. Um, next up, we have Christy Bergman from Zillis. <laughs> oh, okay. Is that working? Okay. 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 Uh, hello. Um, happy to be here. Um, Sebastian really enjoyed your demo, so I'm jealous. I have, I have demo envy. Um, uh, so we are a vector database, um, Zillas. Uh, we are based on a, oh, first about me. My name is Christy Bergman. I'm a developer advocate at Zillas. Um, and typical slides, we are founded in 2017, um, based in Redwood Shores. Um, our open source project is called Milvis, vector database. And, um, a lot of people are wonder, okay, what Zill is? Zill is the maintainers of Milvis, and we have a cloud version that is based on Milvis. So I'm gonna I'm gonna demo both of both versions tonight. Oops. Um, yeah, saw some people. <laughs> yeah, so I'll demo both a little bit of both tonight, and um, I'm gonna go. I'm going to focus more on demoing, focus on the open source and just kind of like going back to basics of why open source matters when we have these open AI agents. 
so, you know, one of the things, um, and I just did this on Barb, which has the new Gemini, and it's still, there's still hallucinations. Um, so, you know, I can ask a question, uh, three politicians born in New York City, the first answer is Hillary Clinton, and you check Wikipedia, that is not, that was a hallucination. Um, I think one other thing I heard tonight about, um, about just, you know, the context length is so long. There's still this issue with uh, the fact that it's been shown that it's not just adding more stuff into the prompt. Um, you actually need to put the right stuff um, in your prompt. So in this paper, uh, Lost in the Middle, they show uh, accuracy on the y-axis and the number of things you stuff into your prompt on the x-axis and it doesn't go it it does not go up as you stuff more stuff <laughs> all right so so this is the reason why we have um this this coding pattern called rag and let me make this bigger um so you've probably all heard many, many times about RAG, but the basic concept is um, you take your data, oops, I forgot to do one more. Um, oops. I forgot to do one more little slide thing. Um, um, just assuming that everybody knows why models hallucinate. Um, you, we, we know that they hallucinate just because of the nature of an LLM is trained on internet data, um, which is great. Like if, you, if you're trying to predict things like the chicken walked across the, it's probably a road, but there's other stuff that the model that LLMs have been trained on, which like for example, Reddit, and they don't always make sense. Um, and so reminder where the embeddings come from, they come from next last layer of a deep learning model, uh, not typically not the last layer, which is the soft max, which is like maybe 10 things for 10, num 10 numbers, for example. Um, and when we talk about transformers, they come from the next to last layer of the embedding. Um, so the, there's the encoder decoder. Um, and people have learned that you just take the encoder part, you get the embedding model, and you take just the decoder part and you have chat GPT or instruct GPT. Okay, so I think that's, the, that's kind of my quick background. Now I'll get back to my code. Okay, so so this rag pattern, basically you're taking, um, it's a little bit too big. Huh, okay. Uh, you're taking your custom data and you pass it through chunk, chunk and embed it. Um, and then you store these vectors into a vector database. And then you stuff the, what's retrieved from your vector database into the prompt along with your question. You send it to a Gen AI model and you get a more reliable answer. Um, so now, oops. Not good. <laughs> All right, so just I'm just going to kind of step through some code um, just to show how you would work with with Milvis. Um, so Milvis is it's it's weavy, it's like we hate I have to say it's a, it's an open source vector database. Um, so in this example, I'm going to take some read the docs um, documentation about Milvis, and um, I'm going to um, um, just I'm going to I would download these like. So like you would just go to readthedocs.com and maybe just do just do a download um, here with a wget, but I already did that. I stayed, saved it locally. Um, and I'm going to, um, you, you do two things to use Melvis. You need a token, um, an API token. And in this case, I'm gonna mix and match a little bit. I'm, I'm using um, Zilla's cloud. Um, so I'm just gonna need the cluster endpoint. Um, and I'm having a scene. And it, look, it looks kind of like this. So you're going to go to cloud.zillas.com. 
um, if you do the starter one, that's our free tier serverless. If you, you, if you choose other ones, they're paid. Um, so yeah, I just do a starter um, and I have one here and oops, I have to single sign on. Uh, okay, so when you go to, when you create a cluster, you'll see an endpoint here and all you have to do is just copy that and go back to your code. And then I, that's what I put here. So you just need that API token in your cluster endpoint. And then you can connect to connect to your um, Zillas um, that's running in the free serverless. This is a really great way to get started because you got free tier on the cloud um, and you've got open source. Um, and I'm really focused on the open source today. <laughs> okay, so the next thing you do is you have to decide um, about an a embedding model. And um, kind of our philosophy is that we view ourselves as just a very low layer of your Gen AI stack. We're just a database. Um, those, those models are always changing. Um, so for example, what I do is I usually go to this MTEB um, and I just happened to notice this week that there was a shift that usually um, I, I go in and I sort this by, um, I, I've sorted it by retrieval. So I've got the best models uh, descending order. And then I look for the smallest best model. And up, up until this week, it was this BGE large, um, which was ranked number three. And now it's a new model, which I need to now play around with and update my code. But it's very easy at this point. I can just swap out, swap out that new model for, for the old model in my code and try it out. Um, so that's what I'm doing here is, I, I have this um, a choice. I use the the previous best smallest model, uh, the BGE base, um, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to swap that out for the new one and try it out. Um, so this is my open source model. The philosophy is you're going to be you're doing retrieval on your own data. Why not make that easy and free so you can access it as much as you want? Uh, so you can iterate in that development loop. Um, so I'm going to retrieve it. I get the embedding length. I get the max sequence length. The embedding length is the length of your vector, um, which is 768. Um, the sequence length is what the model was trained on. That's the max context length that can handle is 1536. You do need to know these things when you create a collection, which is a table. Um, for the table, you, you need a schema, an index, a distance metric, and a consistency level. So in this case, I'm going to say it's called Milvis Drox. Um, I, I got this from the, from the um, embedding model. I know it's 768. Um, so I, this is like the way we create stuff in Milvis is you create um, just the necessary fields, a primary key and a vector field with the given length. Um, and then we set this enable fields dynamic true. That means you can, that's all you have to specify and you can specify the rest later. Um, then I add an index. Um, an index is basically just taking your data and putting it into a data structure that's going to be efficient for search. Um, so in this case, our the way we do it is um, we typically, I suggest um, best practice this thing called auto index um, on Milvis. In Python, it defaults to HNSW, and in Zilla's um, uh, paid tiers, we're going to have smarter, um, smarter defaults. There's something in our Milvis project called Nowhere, K-N-O-W-H-E-R-E, which is our um, proprietary index, which is, we think, the fastest. Um, yeah, and that's it. Um, so you'll create a, a, a new a new uh, database that way. And then the next thing, this is just where I do, I take advantage of LangChain as somebody mentioned before. Um, so it's pretty simple. I just load, I just load the docs um, from my, my docs that I downloaded locally and I get um, so a LangChain docs object, which I can iterate through. And then the next thing is the chunking. Um, chunking applies to text as well as images. But the, I, the concept is you need a strategy, how are you going to chunk, and you need um, uh, some, some um, functions. So in this case, um, I'm doing, uh, because I know it's HTML, I want to do something uh, called um, 
where I take the headers and my, stra my strategy is just gonna be take each chunk of, of HTML markdown and try to keep those chunks together unless they're too big. If they're too big, then I'll do um, recursive character text splitter. So HTML header text splitter first and then recursive character text splitter after. Um, and um, I think I talked about this here where, yeah, depending on what your type of thing you're chunking, there's different strategies. Um, in this case, when I, I, what we like to do is um, we like to take the, um, like, like, like you've got a structure in your HTML. So keep these headers, keep the headers in your chunk and you actually get a little bit better retrieval. So this is just a little trick um, in LangChain. It's two, two functions, HTML header text splitter and the parent document retriever. Um, and in uh, Llama index, it's um, this, uh, I can't read it myself. It's, it's the combination of um, hierarchical node parser and auto merging retriever. So it's the same concepts in both libraries. Um, yeah, so that's what's going on here. Um, and yeah, I'll just, I'll just use those techniques and then I'll end up with chunks that look like this. So here's an example, chunk. Um, I've got, um, as my metadata, I've got, you know, the header, I've got the header two in my metadata. And then I've also got the source, um, document, uh, HTML as a metadata. And then I've got this chunk of text. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's what, what, what. Another thing to point out is that I only had eight HTML files and it chunked into 55, for example. So these chunks are what is gonna be stored in the database. Um, so now we're ready to take these chunks, um, which is some text and my metadata as well as the vector. And um, it's pretty simple. This is, there's many ways to do this, but in this case, I'm gonna loop through. I'm just gonna loop through my chunks and I'm gonna take that encoder that I fetched from, eight, from Hugging Face before. So I, I should have emphasized that a bit more earlier. Um, when, I, when, I get the when I get that, the way I do it is I just take, this, I just take an encoder. So this is an open source encoder. And I use that encoder object now So now I'm gonna use that same encoder object here um, and create, create the embeddings, normalize them, um, and make sure I keep my, if, make sure I get those metadatas if I have them. So I try H1 and H2. Um, and I create a list of dictionaries and then I insert, I use my collection.insert command of those chunk lists to insert. So yeah, um, you should insert those really quickly. Um, and then now we're ready to ask questions about our data. And so like, let's say I have a question, what are the parameters for HNSW? What do those mean? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And um, yeah, so this is another reason to have open source because there's like, you want to, you want to like inspect what's retrieved and see if you're, see if you need to, um, five minutes. Okay. Thanks. You, you want to inspect what's retrieved and, and see if you need to iterate. And if you're using open AI, which I noticed every demo before me used, you have to pay, uh, you're, you're running up a bill. And especially if you're in development mode, you can run up a bill pretty quickly. So this is another reason just to you know, keep yourself open with with open source embedding models. I can I can retrieve my it's my own data. I can retrieve it as much as I want, and I can look at it and see you know what what kind of results did I get? And maybe I made a mistake with my data. Maybe I needed to clean it some more or something. Or maybe I need to try a different retriever. Um, uh, I used to work at a company called AnyScale, which is distributed compute. So I would run a whole bunch of Raytune experiments, maybe with a whole bunch of different parameter settings. That could run up a bill if I'm doing that. Um, so, so yeah, so that's what I'm doing here. So I, I take a look at what was retrieved. I can see um, header, headers of the document chunk, and I can also see that it came from parameter HTML, which makes sense because I was asking about HNSW parameters. 
and you know just take a, a look at this um it's kind of hard to look at as a human so i'm going to send it to her chat which is the generation part of rag and here here open open source are not as good as 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 um GP, as open ai you're going to get like a gist of an answer from a lot of them, but not as pretty of an answer, human human formed as you're gonna get from OpenAI. So I'm gonna take a super tiny, um, this one's a super, super tiny model, tiny Roberta, which is not a good example, but I just, I just did it. And as a baseline, I give it no context or I give it a neutral context, quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. I ask it my question and it says lazy dog, which is, you know, okay. Um, <laughs> then I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna just take my context that I retrieved from the database and ask it. And it's gonna give me a partial answer. It's just a very small model. And again, what I would do here is, I, I'm a fan of benchmarks, you can tell. So I would probably go here to this um, the chatbot arena. And again, I would probably look for um, the, this, the smallest model that I, I could find. Um, um, Oops, I lost track of my stuff. Um, yeah, I would probably look for the smallest bottle model in Ellipsis. Um, but anyway, so so yeah. So now we we can. The, I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's like all these development iterations you probably want to make, and you may as well do those for free on on an open on an open source model and then when you're done and it looks good now i can send this to open ai so i would i would just you know i'm going to use the turbo um i'm going to set my um so use my open AI api key um yeah and and just um set, send the question um sorry um, okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question. Um, thought I set my temperature, sorry. Okay, I'll look at it later. Um, yeah, so then I'm gonna get an, a, a lot longer answer, which looks good. Um, but yeah, just iterations, iteration steps before you do that final, final um, open AI call. Um, and then I'm gonna do a quick, quick uh, oh, I only have a few minutes. So yeah, so what, what happens here is, um, this is um, on the left. I've got my S3, so I would I put those exact same HTML files in my S3 bucket, and then I could go to my Zillas and I could do this thing called pipelines, and it ingests automatically this data. Um, so let me go here. Oops, let me go here. Um, so I I created one already. Um, but it looks like this. You could do pipelines and then create plus create a pipeline. Um, if I look at the one that I created, um, you can see it's got a schema, a very simple schema. And then you can see that it's got all of my um, all of my read the docs docs in there. So you can see like this one's the API.html. Um, so that's all, all loaded in, in this um, in my free tier. And then I can go back to my code. And I basically just um, I just do an API call to that um, to that collection and that pipeline, and I can ask it the same question. I'll get the same to the same top K, um, and I should get pretty much the same similar answer. Which here, this is just me inspecting that. Um, oh, one more demo thing. So I I fetch api.html there's there's a question i get a lot of times is do i need um do i need a um sql database along with a vector database and the answer is no because you can do metadata filter here so i could change it to for example i only want documents called param um and um yeah, and so you know it'll filter, and there's a lot of business reasons why you might want to filter because, like, you want more recent data, or you're looking for shoes and you only want size X of men's shoes in black. Um, there's many reasons why metadata filtering is useful along with vector search. Okay, so that was just a quick demo of metadata filter, um, and then I, I go ahead and just um, send that to an open AI again, and I get a, a good answer again, just for, just to show you this automated Zilla's pipeline works um, similarly. So um, yeah, so that was, um, 
and I meant to show, I meant to show one, I don't know, if, this is a fun thing. I just noticed on TripAdvisor and I recognize it, this when I see it as, as retrieval because I can say, hey, I wanna go to Mendocino, California um, and it asks me, okay, when do you wanna go? And I'm gonna say, I wanna go, you know, maybe I wanna go take my Christmas break there. Um, and, and then it says, you know, I'm gonna go with my boyfriend and I wanna do all kinds of stuff. Um, and I wanna hunt mushrooms. And um, I don't know if it's gonna tell me. Um, Uh oh, maybe I shouldn't have said I wanted to hunt mushrooms. Okay. All right. So yeah, so it's like I I feel like this retrieval stuff is just the the magic sauce behind um applications because now it gives me an itinerary, what to do every day, suggestions where to eat, what where to stay. I mean, yeah, and I don't know, let me see if I see anything special about mushrooms. Well, I'll have to look at this closer, but there, there you go. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Christy. I know we are getting eager to go back and see all those demos, but we have one last talk by Stefan from Dagworks. Hello. All right, I'm your last talk. I'm your uh, the thing between I don't know drinks and uh, whatever. Okay, let's see. I want to mirror my displays. Actually, slideshow. Um, hi, my name's Stefan. I'm the CEO of a company called Dagworks, uh, but I'm here to talk to you about a, an open source project that I created uh, back at Stitch Fix, which then, uh, you know, open sourced and I decided to start a company around. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you uh, or try to give you or convince you uh, why you should give Hamilton a shot uh, as you're building out your uh, Gen AI or LM apps. Uh, so some questions, audience participation, please. Um, who here writes Python code? Okay, sorry. Uh, who here has a Gen AI or LLM app in production? You, cool, awesome. Um, who here would class themselves as a data scientist? A few of you, okay. What about machine learning engineer? A few, okay. Uh, Backend engineer or front end engineer? Okay, a handful. Okay, so mostly back in people. Cool. Um, so, uh, talk is, you know, roughly trying to make sure that it's, you know, I, I do it in 20 minutes, but two parts. Uh, first, going to talk about challenges in terms of, uh, you know, uh, delivering Gen AI apps uh, in this current, like, point in time. And then I'm going to talk to you and explain to you a little about Hamilton. So, hopefully, going to help you, uh, you know, Crack the nut, as it were, as, as the kind of the images uh, that I prompted Dali with, uh, in terms of figuring out your uh, software development lifecycle, uh, kind of problems that you have uh, developing apps. So first, challenges. One, uh, who here knew what a rag was or LLM was a year ago? No one, right? Well, a few, right? So. Everything in this last year is like pretty much new, right? I mean, it's crazy. Uh, I didn't know what it was. And so everything that we've been kind of processing has been pretty nascent, right? Um, who here does things correctly the first time? Right? Not many, right? And so which case we're all learning. And so which case part of the challenge with the space is like we're doing things for the first time and learning it. And so which case there's going to be, you know, uh, mistakes and you're going to have to backtrack them, et cetera, right? The other is, you know, two. Uh, 
we had you know chat gpt you know, launched about just you know, almost a year ago or just 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 a bit more but then we've seen a lot of foundational models three three and a half four come out like multimodal just coming out all these new things that dropped last week right uh and then i come from the classic world of machine learning right uh and so in comparison to that booting an application is so much faster these days right and so in which case the pace of not only the space changing in terms of the tooling and technology, but then also the development aspect, right? Is like, it's so much faster. You can put something together and get something out, which is, which is in terms of, you know, adds to the challenge of how do you keep up? And so all of this, that, so what you need to tie all this together is some software engineering skills, right? Um, uh, it, it, to glue together the vector database with the inputs of documents to the LLM app with the prompt and like with the safety checks and the filters, like all of that requires software engineering skills. Does anyone recognize this image here? Awesome, first time. So this is a pretty famous image. Uh, of law. Uh, so if you uh, have done machine learning for a long time, this is a pretty classic paper that came out of Google. The point being here is that if you're trying to get, say, machine learning to production, the code for machine learning is this tiny box. And the things that, that you need to engineer for and provide to actually run a production system are all these other things. And so you spend a lot more time on the other things and what you have to engineer to get something to production than you do just for like getting, you know, fitting a statistical model and then uh, uh, creating a prediction. Gen AI LM apps are no different. They're effectively a subset of machine learning, right? And so here I have a, a slide that's inspired by, the, uh, I saw a talk from the uh, uh, Descali from the CEO of Kaggle, but effectively uh, the point here is that with Gen AI LM apps, the code for you know the the prompt and the LM is, is pretty tiny, uh, but there's all these other things you need to engineer for and integrate into uh, the, the app that you're kind of building. And then if you take a step back, like software development, if you really think about it, uh, is less of a drag race. So Langchain, I want to say, is cute. It will get you and show you that great demo, like a dragster, right? But Software engineering is more in the, in the business. It's more about how can you go as quickly as possible and lap and do many laps as fast as possible to win the race. So it's more like Formula One, where you know consistency and speed over time is actually what wins you, uh, uh, you know, the, the prize. And so, what's at stake here with the software engineering that you build these Gen AI apps with, right? If you get it wrong, like from an IC perspective. You have to inherit someone else's shitty code. You have to live in tech debt. And no, no one likes that work. Um, from the business, right, you then have a high cost of change. So say ChatGPT5 came out. How quickly could you assess whether it was worth the cost for you to change your app to make use of it, right? And effectively, over time, like this accumulates as tech debt, and it's slower to develop. But if you get it right, like as an IC, you get to ship more code, right? What, what gives you promotions? Things that ship, right? And so, you know, that's an incentive to like iterate quickly. And then from a business perspective, right, you can get more return on investment. Your resources are more useful, they can produce more, uh, and you get more out of them. What I think are some characteristics that can help here from a software engineering construct, you know, help you, you know, uh, get it right. Well, one is you gotta be able to change things with confidence. So you gotta have a great testing story. You're gonna have swappable parts. Okay, you want Milvis? Great, but then, oh look, you have uh, some other database comes out or other, it's cheaper. You wanna be able to swap that database out and not really pay too much for it, right? Uh, in terms of cost of changing. Uh, and then you're always tweaking, creating new apps and things. So how can you reuse what you have uh, to give you a warm start and, you know, and, and get you on your way? And then every business is different. You have to layer on your different concerns Right? And so how can you take your code from Jupyter Notebook to you know, production uh, pretty easily? How can you plug in, say, oh, I want to use Ray, but no, actually, we, we have Dask. Or I have my own concerns. I need to figure out caching. And we have our own thing. And so I want to plug that in. Right? And so I think these are you know, certain things or characteristics that you know, we should look for in how we're engineering uh, these applications. So on to Hamilton. Um, 
What is Hamilton in a sentence? I'll unpack this. Uh, is a micro orchestration framework for defining data flows where you write declarative functions. The high level is uh, you get a lot of software engineering best practices without really thinking about it. So testing, documentation, modularity, iteration, blah, blah, blah. But um, uh, this came out of Stitch Fix. This is not a new library. I created it back in 2019, open source at the end of 2021. Uh, it's battle tested and is you know, used in production in, in various contexts. Uh, more on that in a bit. Uh, to unpack that sentence, what do I mean by micro orchestration versus macro orchestration? Macro is, 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 is kind of this whole thing here, right? You're thinking about uh, classically like an ETL. Load some data, transform it, create a model, et cetera. Uh, in the new age, it could be, uh, you know, one service does some processing, you call another service, et cetera. Micro orchestration, on the other hand, is really focused on that, you know, one computational step. And this is what Hamilton's roots are and what it focuses on. What do I mean by data flow? If you're not a computer scientist, um, uh, let me explain. Uh, a, a data flow effectively explains how code, uh, sorry, how data flows and how it's transformed and computed. So here I have some procedural pandas code, right? We can actually represent that as a data flow or a directed acyclic graph, meaning we can actually express the, the set of operations and the order of how something should be computed uh, to get a result. What do I mean by declarative functions? Well, these functions in Hamilton, as, you'll, as I'll show you, uh, as you read them, they will declare what they create in the data flow. And then the function uh, parameters will declare dependencies of what's required for computation. Now, you don't run these functions directly, but the idea is you can read this function and you'll understand what it does and what it needs. So. Hamilton, effectively, you can think of it as a paradigm. So it's a way of thinking, way of writing. So instead of writing procedural code, so here I'm kind of uh, assigning C uh, and, and D. So C is some prompt, and D is, say, the output of some LLM. Instead, we would rewrite this as two functions. Uh, so rather than so one function called C, because that's just you know what we named it. Obviously, we would name it something more, more, more interesting or credible to understand. Uh, uh, but the idea is anything that you have we have variable assignment, for example, you effectively you know, map that to a function. And then the function input arguments just specify what's required to compute it. Now, you might be like, hey, I had two lines of code, now I've got like you know, six. You know, th th there's a good reason for that. Let me uh, uh, get into that in a bit. But uh, uh, as I said earlier, you write functions, but you don't run them, so you need some driver code. Um, and so the point of the driver code is to import uh, some Hamilton constructs and then import the kind of module where your functions are defined. You then uh, create some uh, a dri what we call a driver. This effectively takes some configuration uh, and then you can it instantiates a data flow or a directed acyclic graph representation. And so the point here is C and D map to these nodes C and D here. And because when things were constructed. Hamilton did not find uh, uh, you know, any functions that describe A and B, so then it expects them as input or its configuration. Uh, and then given this graph, uh, you can compute any subset you want of it. You just got to specify what outputs you want and provide the right inputs, and then Hamilton will go figure out and compute a result for you. Uh, and so in terms of context of Gen AI or LLM apps, like Hamilton, you can use it in place of Langchain or LAM index, or actually just because it's Python code, you can actually mix, mix and match the two. You can have your Hamilton code, Langchain, et cetera. But uh, the point is, uh, you know, if you're uh, you know, uh, fed up with some of the Langchain stuff, like give Hamilton a shot. Things I won't mention, but just to impression on you, is that we have a lot of rich you know, things that you could decorate a function with. I won't go in them here, just to, but just to mention that like, yes, we have a lot more functionality than I'm gonna show you. Uh, and then my obligatory logo slide. So here's a bunch of logos. Uh, they're all using Hamilton production for various different purposes, uh, just to give you a bit of you know, social proof. Um, but in terms of you know, why I think you should be using Hamilton to help build your uh, Gen AI LA maps. The first is, uh, it's one less tool to learn, right? Uh, 
invariably you're going to be connecting your uh, you know the, the things that you kind of create with other, other things and Hamilton can kind of be the one tool that you could use for data processing feature engineering you know machine learning gen AI stuff where even web request stuff uh, because it serves general purpose uh, this graph here on the right or uh, your right um, uh, can be used to describe many things so this could be you know some text input we could be creating a prompt we could be going at open AI and then you know figuring out some result Similarly, we could use the same, Hamilton can be used to uh, describe, you know, uh, loading in a file, uh, creating an embedding, uh, or processing it, creating, chunking it, creating an embedding, uh, storing that embedding in a vector database. You get the picture, very general purpose, one tool uh, to describe a lot of things. It's also portable, pluggable, and extensible. Um, the code that you write, you could go from your notebook and plug it into FastAPI, for example. Uh, or maybe you want to uh, parallelize processing PDFs um, uh, into embeddings. You can then, you know, uh, run that and scale that onto kind of Ray, Dask, or Spark. Uh, and effectively, Hamilton runs anywhere that Python runs. For the extensibility side, you're just going to have to trust me on this. It's a short talk, but we have some VLDB uh, workshop papers that you can uh, can kind of read about uh, some of the kind of constructs and, and, and hooks that we have uh, that you can kind of extend the Hamilton platform itself or framework itself. The third is, you know, lineage is code. With Hamilton, uh, it's a very uh, clear mapping between, you know, uh, a directed cyclic graph or data flow and functions. Uh, so this means if you encode your prompt, uh, the, the uh, you know, large language model, you know, version or API that you're using and any other processing logic, you can actually commit that to Git and you have a nice GitOps flow of how everything is versioned together. So. Uh, it's very easy then to go back in time or roll back changes in production um, uh, because everything is code. Uh, subsequently, this also then helps with debugging, onboarding and explaining things because you can always visualize it, right? And so you make a change, you can go visualize it. And so then it's very easy then for someone who's new to the code base to get up and running uh, and understand uh, what's going on. The fourth is modularity and reuse. So here I have a, um, uh, a, an, an older, uh, uh, you could say, visualization. We, we've kind of changed things a little bit. Uh, say we're creating, um, a, taking as input a query, uh, of some sort of embedding client, creating embedding, and then you know, we're creating some nearest neighbor IDs because we want to um, you know, uh, do something with that. If I want to, I have this chunk, and I then want to kind of use it in some other flow, all I need to do is, you know, connect uh, a function that depends on this. So basically writing a function that depends on nearest neighbor IDs. And I've created an edge and I've extended things and I can you know, reuse this kind of uh, uh, flows. Um, and then say I want to change something. Say I want to change the nearest neighbor IDs implementation. Hamilton has constructs here. So for example, if I want to change this particular node, uh, all I need to do is make, like, you know, I, I can at configuration time uh, switch out what it's doing, or I could even uh, at a Python module level switch out this entire kind of subgraph or uh, implementation with a different version uh, very easily. And this downstream is none the wiser, right? And so in terms of the software engineering required to kind of change things, Hamilton, you get a lot of things out of the box without you having to think about it. And then the fifth thing is testing and documentation, right? It's a bread and butter topic for most people of like, what is good software engineering? Um, from a testing perspective, Hamilton has a great code testing story. Uh, every function that you write with Hamilton is unit testable, right? And so it's very easy then to kind of, you know, as a, my toy, toy uh, example here, uh, you know, testing the output of, you know, formatting a prompt. Um, but also has a great integration testing story. Uh, with Hamilton, you can, uh, execute any sub-portion of the graph. So this means that if I had this prompt connect to an open AI, uh, some sort of LLM call uh, in my CI CD, CD system, if I wanted to run through a set of evals of things of it, Hamilton makes it very easy to just test a particular sub-portion of a graph. And so you can add that to your, uh, you know, as part of your development process in terms of checking things into production or, or, or qualifying changes to make sure they haven't broken anything. Uh, if you need runtime data quality checks or introspection, Hamilton has a hook for that. Uh, as you can kind of read it, it checks the output. Um, and so it's extensible. We have Pandera support and uh, Pydantic support on the roadmap, if you use that. Uh, and then otherwise, in terms of uh, you read code more often than you write it, Hamilton is a little more verbose, but that's on purpose. The idea is that someone else can come in and read it and understand it or 
you get pages in the middle of the night, you know, need to understand some code. Uh, the idea is, you know, with Hamilton, you, you are forced to document things more clearly and easily than you otherwise would have. And so you can also even add extra annotations as you kind of see with that tag here on things. Uh, and then otherwise, just to emphasize, uh, visualization is something that comes with Hamilton for free. And so it's very easy to always have this, um, some sort of graph that explains uh, some sort of execution that's going on. So uh, to kind of summarize this talk, like one, you know, the, the space is changing. It's very quick. Who knows where we'll be in a year? Who knows how long context windows will be in a year? Do you even need a vector database? Um, uh, and then the pace of iteration isn't going to slow down. But, you know, if you don't have good software engineering practices, right, you're going to be potentially in a world of tech debt. And so uh, give, give Hamilton a go. You know, it, it, it's, it's about how fast you can, uh, you know, consistently go around a racetrack quickly, right? And so with Hamilton, you can simplify some of your tooling by having one tool that can work across the different kind of use cases. Uh, you can port uh, your code to different contexts. You can plug in different backends, and then you can extend the framework. Uh, if you want a versioning story, connect it with Git uh, and Lineage. Uh, or, or you have a nice versioning debug and uh, understanding story with Lineage's code, which you can kind of connect with Git. Uh, and then things are naturally more modular, reusable, uh, without much thought. So give it to a junior dev or data scientist, machine engineer. Uh, they're going to write code that you're not going to be terrified of inheriting. And then really isn't any uh, reason to complain a, a, about code that isn't testable or documentation friendly if using Hamilton. The, everything's func in functions. You always have a doc string. Uh, and so everything's always a, has a great testing and documentation story. So small plug for what I'm doing at uh, Dagworks. If you know what Langsmith is, then, uh, you know, and you want the equivalent of that for Hamilton, stop by our table. Happy to give you a demo. We also have a toy Gen AI app built with Hamilton. So if you want to see what you know an actual app using Hamilton kind of looks like, we can kind of walk you through that. And then just to put the uh, the feelers out there, we are looking to develop you know more specialized uh, uh, you know uh, 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 functionality in the DagWorks platform for you know Gen AI LM apps. So we're looking to partner closely with someone there. So if you want you know someone on the cheap to kind of build some cool stuff, come come chat. Um, but otherwise, you can sign up for free at Dagworks, and effectively, if you want versioning, lineage, and catalog, and observability, uh, we've got you covered with a one-line code change. So, uh, so if anything, you know, uh, hopefully, I have enticed you all to give Hamilton a go. It's just a library; you can get up and running in like 15 minutes. We have an in-browser tutorial called TryHamilton.dev uh, that's running PyDide. Um, if you want to learn the basics, we are building out a hub. Um, it's called, uh, so similar to Llama Hub and you know, Lang, what Lang, Lang Chain has. Uh, so it's going to be a bank of data flows that you can get started in like three minutes uh, pretty easily. We have a blog, obviously, that can help you. Uh, uh, it talks about RAG uh, architectures, prompts, and you know, how you can integrate, say, Hamilton with Airflow. And then otherwise, you know, would love a star. So if you if you want to bookmark uh, Hamilton or, or this talk or, or me, would love you know like take a picture of the QR code and give Hamilton a star. Uh, but otherwise, um, yeah, happy to take questions or find me over there at at the uh, at my table. At the table. Yep. Thank you, Stefan. All right. Are you ready for hearing who won the blue headphone, the wireless headphone? Do we have Praveen Kumar here? 